We're having this conversation, woman. Yes, we are. Yes. Oh my goodness. Okay. First of all, I have to ask what I love to ask. Can you believe we're having it? I knew you were going to ask me this question. And I'm going to say what a lot of other people say is yes and no. But the probably more yes than no. I mean, I role played having this conversation with you probably about a year ago, right? That's how committed I was to it happening. So I guess more yes, actually. But then there's a part of me that is still occasionally in disbelief. But I'm just, I'm so happy and I'm proud. I'm so proud and grateful. That's how I'm feeling right now. Yeah. Me too. I, I got to admit, like when I was, you know, when I was prepping for this, like I was getting a little misty about this, mm-hmm. knowing your story and, and just the impact that it's going to have and, and the gratitude that I have that you're sharing it. So why don't you start off by sharing with the ladies listening, how you found yourself on this journey and how we met? Yeah. So <laughs> I go back a long way because you, your messages, you're the fertility mindset master, right? Which of course you are. (laughs) And for me, I was the polar opposite. I was a disaster. I mean, literally, I, I, when I talk about it, I think, God, am I sounding too dramatic? But no, I really had a very problematic mindset that started in my late teens. Okay, so that's kind of where the story began. And I appreciate for some women when they encounter difficulties conceiving and, 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 and carrying pregnancies to term, it, it's a surprise to them when, when it becomes difficult. For me, this felt like a long, slow, ominous train coming down the line for, for years. And it's, it's crazy. So I think by the time I met you, I was already kind kind of 20 years for feeling a certain kind of way and but when I met you Roseanne it it was certainly a pivotal moment it was a crossroads you know and and I'll certainly love to talk about exactly why that was but I guess I I do have to start from the beginning which yeah was it was my late teens and I kind of developed a sort of a belief system really and that belief system was there's something wrong there's something wrong with you and you can't have a baby and it and and it just sort of lingered and it loitered and it was always there in the background and it and it, and it sort of seeped into other areas of my life and it would pop up very discreetly but I, I carried it as some kind of secret I didn't talk about it it was sort of shaped with a bit of shame and and when you don't talk about things it, it stays very you know it kind of just stays put but yeah that was the feeling that I had and later in life when I got a bit more insightful and I'd lived a bit more life and I started getting more curious and asking more questions I thought why why have I felt this way this is this is crazy and it was a perfect combination a perfect storm if you like of I, I had some hormonal things I call I called it a bit wonky I felt a bit wonky in my mid-teens there was a thinking for a while that I might have had PCOS because some of the symptoms I had. Um, but I, I developed a sort of a mistrust in my body. You know, my body was doing things that didn't feel like it was functioning as female, as a woman should. Um, and that was very, very potent. And, and it affected me very deeply, much more than I think I really realized at the time. Because again, I wasn't sharing it. I, I, I kept it all inside. And then the other aspect was probably some, you know, emotional stuff to do with with a relationship with my own mum. I love my mum very much, and we have a great, we have a good relationship now. But at that time in my life, it was it was complicated. And I think the two of those things together, uh, without me really fully realizing, created this this mindset, this belief system, and it and it really locked itself in hard. Um, And it kind of went through my twenties when I was in my early 20s my menstrual cycle just stopped out of the blue for about seven months and again everything became validation everything was validation for the fact that this thing that I felt was correct I had a a dream (laughs) I mean it was a dream but this dream was so visceral to me and again it was like right that's confirmation that this is some kind of higher power message that you Katie can't have a baby you know how could your body conceive and do something so amazing as a grow a baby. So I went through my 20s and, and, it, and it impacted, yeah, it impacted my relationships, how I felt about myself um, around other people. And in fact, the first time I probably experienced a mindset shift was in my late, tw- late 20s. And I had a bit of therapy 
bit of talking therapy. And that really helped lift something I felt about meeting somebody and, and finding a relationship. And as soon as that shifted, it just felt light and easy. And two months later, I met my partner, Adam, and we've been together now. It will be 10 years this year. Okay, so that 10 years has gone by real quick. Yeah. <laughs> but looking back, I think, oh, shit. Yeah. The mindset changed. The outcome changed. But I didn't register fully that that's what had happened. Um, but still, I wasn't really sharing how I felt about having a baby. I, I, my coping mechanism, and I don't know if anyone can relate to this, is the way I camouflaged it was to become a big people pleaser. Because my profession is I'm a performer, I'm a musician, so I can put on a bit of a show, right? And I love it, and that's a big part of who I am. But I also now understand that I used it, I weaponized it to, to keep things at a distance, to keep things feeling safe, to be in a slight denial, to kind of uh, just bat it away. And, and I would people please. And I did that when I was dating because it felt like I had to hustle. I have to hustle for this. I have to keep, I have to keep working really hard to keep this relationship going, to keep this person happy. Um, because I was fighting this deep rooted insecurity, huge insecurity that there was a problem. Um, and even when I met Adam and I had this, uh, you know, very different experience of, of that relationship, the baby thing, it was still, it was still clinging on. So, um, but this whole time, you know, I'm 36 now and I'd never attempted to try to get pregnant, right? So this fear, this mindset was based on nothing but my own head and how powerful my mind is and was <laughs> in a bad way. Um, I'd had no tests. I had no doctor tell me, yeah, there's the, 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 you're right, nothing. Um, so I was incredibly committed. I was very loyal. I was very tenacious, actually, about this particular way of thinking. So um, I got to 36 and uh, I'd, again, I sort of sat back. And I remember my 35th birthday, which is this age that you talk about, like this bullshit sort of number where on the, on the strike <laughs> of midnight, you turn 35 and it all, it all, you know, falls off the edge of a cliff. Um, and I remember my 35th birthday just feeling a little bit upset inside and just feeling disjointed. And, uh, but I, 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 I still couldn't express it. I couldn't fully express it. So uh, we reached a point where we were both sort of saying, because I knew Adam wanted to have children. That was really important. And we started trying. And I remember this voice, and you call it saboteur. You know, that's your, that's your language for it. And I called it my gremlin. That was my sort of way of describing it. And the gremlin piped up and said, <laughs> get ready. Okay, Katie, you're going to try and have a baby, right? Well, get ready for the shit show. I remember standing in my, my old flat and, and hearing this voice. And this voice has been, you know, it's been so deeply unkind, Roseanne. Just so, I, when I look back and, I, and I'm, so, I'm so glad that I can look back now and see it. Uh, for what it was but it was so deeply unkind and, and really toxic actually so we started trying but but you're trying for something all the while this this script is running in the background saying what are you doing forget about it this is not this ain't gonna happen four months five months six months we weren't falling pregnant but actually I was becoming more curious and more proactive in my own menstrual cycle you know I was learning about when I was ovulating so that bit was positive went to the doctors, did the, the standard tests. And I was bracing, I was bracing for this kind of like dystopian moment where, you know, you've for so long, you thought the boogeyman's under the bed and then you look and yes, there he is. But it didn't, that didn't happen. It didn't happen. All, all my tests were normal. The plot twist was that it was actually Adam's results were um, a little bit that maybe there was a reason why we weren't getting pregnant. He had um, low morphology. So more tests, more investigations. Again, nothing, nothing coming up for me. Everything internally was, was norm, normal, you know, this word normal. Everything's normal. Uh, but after 18 months of, of, of trying, we hadn't fallen pregnant. And this was just turning the volume up even louder on this gremlin that was kind of going, aha, you know, almost how, how, what did you think was going to happen? 
And it's exhausting. It's exhausting because you feel like you're dragging this sodding thing around with you that is just bringing you down. It's knocking you down. It's how it felt. It's how it felt. It was sort of like this slug just sort of draped around me. Um, and I'd already, you know, so already I'd, cr- I was already cried so many tears and felt a, a certain kind of way about something so many years before. But here I was in real time. And it's very weird, very odd feeling like, well, it's coming to fruition. It, it, it's, it's actually playing out. Um, so after 18 months, we'd lined ourselves up with some IUI with the NHS. Uh, we were fortunate that you, you, you get offered four free goes. And um, I was thinking it might not happen because the doctor was going to be on holiday when I was expecting my cycle. But bloody typical. He's on his holidays. We're going to have to wait another <laughs> cycle. <laughs> but actually, my period didn't show up. It didn't show up. And uh, three, four days passed. And, I, and I, I was thinking, oh, my God. And I know a lot of people listening will, will love taking pregnancy tests and, you know, pee sticks. I'm, I'm not that person. I avoid. I, I like to stay in a place of maybe. Oh, maybe. <laughs> but after a week, I, you know, I love a maybe. But after about a week. I, I really started to think, okay, I think I'm, I think I'm pregnant. Um, and then for some obscure reason, I was thinking, I'll wait till the Monday. It was the Sunday. I thought, I'll wait till the Monday to test, and then I'll tell Adam, and we'll have this fairy tale ending. On the Sunday morning, I woke up, and I started bleeding. Um, poor Adam, bless him. He, he didn't know what was happening. Just He just sort of woke up to find me, you know, very emotional. And we talked about it, and... Um, almost to the point where I started to doubt if I, ha- if I had been pregnant. Uh, because at that point, the pregnancy test wasn't showing as negative. But later that day, physically, it was undeniable. I was, I was having a very early miscarriage. And we went straight into IUI. Because by the pure fact that we'd conceived, something got unlocked. It's like, hang on a minute, this doesn't, this doesn't follow the, the narrative that you've been sticking with. Because that, that message was, you can't get pregnant. Well, I, I just did. No, it didn't last, but hey, miscarriages, they're not uncommon, especially the, you know, the first pregnancy. So it unlo- unlocked something, and we went, I went you know, bounding forwards with this new type of feeling into our IUI. I remember it was like it was a May, and it was a beautiful sunny day in London. And, and I'm not exaggerating what I say. When, it, when the sun is shining in London, you know, that's enough to put you in a great mood, but... <laughs> And I felt good. I felt really good. And uh, we went in, had, the, had, you know, and two weeks later, I got, a, I got a positive pregnancy test. I got my first positive pregnancy test. And I felt, um, I, think I, I think I felt happy for about a day. And what I can only describe as a feeling of being hijacked with anxiety, because what happens is if, if you're so committed and you're so entrenched in a way of thinking that you don't even realize that you're immersed in this belief system when you do something that that shifts it can feel a bit unsafe because the brain which I've learned (laughs) loves familiarity it likes certainty and my certainty was all of this negative shit but hang on a minute here I was with this positive pregnancy test and it was just overwhelmed and um I got taken over by anxiety. Now, anxiety has been something that I have uh, been felt felt very unwell with, you know, uh, as, as, as I sort of can t- share what happened to me. But anxiety took over and that showed up in, you know, waking up very early, feeling shaky, having sort of low level feelings of panic, pacing. I remember going around the block at like 6 a.m. because I couldn't cope with the notion that my body was pregnant because I'd worked so hard for so long to convince myself that something's wrong, something's wrong. So now it just shifted to this isn't going to last. This isn't going to last. This is, you know. So I went for an early scan just thinking this early scan is the thing that's going to just put me in my place and it's going to be proof that everything's okay. And, And unfortunately, that didn't happen. The scan was very inconclusive. The sonographer was very tentative. Planned to go back two weeks later, and but actually, by that time, about two weeks later, I experienced my second miscarriage. It was a natural miscarriage. It happened 
kept at home. And that, that really made the first loss land because I don't think the, the first loss didn't really land because that was the unlocking of, oh my God, we got pregnant. The second loss, the first loss suddenly kind of felt a different kind of way. And I was feeling it was frightening and it was just, I keep saying the word weird because it's very, it is very weird to it feel like your, your nightmare is coming true. This, um, it playing out in real time. So I think I, I spent a summer recovering emotionally. And we went again for a second or IUI, and that wasn't successful. And then we were lined up to go for some IVF with the NHS. Again, by that point, because of my age, I think I was 38, we could still get a free go. Um, and the doctors I was seeing, I think this is again when I think back, I'd started to see quite a few different people by this point. You know, the further into this process, the more people that you encounter. And I realized I'd encountered some really um, less favorable language uh, from some of the doctors. I remember getting a letter that was, I was copied into a letter, I think, from one doctor to another. And, and on the letter, it's very brief, it said, I've, I've consulted with Miss, with Katie. Um, she's 37, so time is not on her side. And I remember standing in my bedroom, reading this letter, hearing, you know, and that was the first time it was like a ooh, dagger to the heart. <laughs> And I remember another doctor, um, again, just saying, well, you might as well go straight for IVF, bringing up my age. And I don't want to sound like I know a lot of people. And, and as you say, Roseanne, it's not about slamming all people, or, you know, all medical um, people. But I think that was, I, I, was, I, I realized, I understood that you, you hear these different things and it doesn't make you feel good. So, but we, we were lined up for this round of IVF at the end of 2019 same thing happened my period was late took a pregnancy test I was pregnant for the third time naturally for the second time um and I remember that Christmas we went away we came to New York didn't tell anybody um and went for an early scan this time it was different there was a heartbeat um so we'd never had that before and the sonographer this time said, well, look, let's, because of what's gone before, let's, let's be cautious and let's bring you back. And I think I, I still wouldn't say I felt happy. I think anxiety still very much was, was with me. Um, you know, it wasn't an easy time. Being pregnant did not feel like an easy time. And we went back two weeks later and unfortunately, once again, um, well, this time it was confirmed, this, this pregnancy had ended, no heartbeat. And uh, we later found out that it was a chromosomal problem. But the miscarriage physically was on a whole other level. It, it, physically, it was very, very difficult, very painful. Um, it took about a month. You know, I experienced extreme sort of physical trauma, I guess. Um, got to February 2020. And we're getting into the COVID phase. <laughs> so my world felt like it was turned on its, on its head. And then it felt like the whole world did the same thing. It was, it was a very strange parallel. Um, and we were fortunate to get some private tests. Uh, we took loads of bloods because this whole time I was thinking, it was like the bloody, it was like the Da Vinci Code. I was thinking, I need to, fi I need to fix, I need to solve this puzzle. I need to know the answer. Have, have I been a psychic the whole time? You know, am, I, am I in tune with this sort of higher knowing? And I've known this whole time, and, and what did I expect? Or is it just a complete coincidence? Or is my mind so powerful that I've actually cultivated? This is, I've brought this. I, and I was thinking, I thought about it so much. Blood test didn't really reveal much. Um, and I think it was sort of going into the autumn of 2020, where we went into our, we prayed privately for some IVF, uh, for IVF mild IVF, where the, 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 the notion is you take less medication, but you're meant to get better, better quality. And that first round, again, anybody listening who's done IVF for the first time, you think, this is going to, this is going to, this is going to solve it. This is going to 
be the answer. And we got eight, eight eggs and they were all mature. They all fertilized. And I thought, oh God, here we go. Okay, now the, now the tides are turning. Maybe we're going to win. We're going to win this time. And like a game of snakes and ladders, right? Sometimes you think you've got a, you, do you know snakes and ladders? Do you have that game? <laughs> you Sometimes you think you've got a ladder. You know, I don't know. And you know shoots that and ladders is, I think, what oh, we had okay. in the well, States. Maybe it's ladders, the same yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you think you've got a ladder, right? You think you've done this, woohoo. And then on a dime, you get a snake. And, and all of our embryos, all eight embryos, none of them were any good. None of them made it. Uh, so we came back with a zero. And again, this, this hustle. Every, the whole time I felt like I've got to hustle for this. I've got to hustle for this baby. I've got to work harder. So I did all the things. And I've been doing all the things. Acupuncture, nutrition, um, everything. Uh, kinesiologist, um, therapy, everything. Urologist, the best urologist in the country. So we went into the second round thinking, okay, right, we're going to outsmart this. We're going we're gonna to beat this by doing this aggressive kind of full-on coming at it from all angles and actually that second go we got fewer eggs fewer embryos and still ended up with a zero still zero so april 2021 was probably i mean i feel like i've fallen apart so many times <laughs> but i really felt like i unraveled fully and i don't know if anybody can relate to this but sometimes when that happens as hideous as it is and as frightening as it is it's also quite um, amazing because you feel like you're just opening yourself wide open and you're I felt like I was surrendering to something just surrendering um, and that's when I found your book okay so so this is the point Roseanne where I saw your book <laughs> and I ordered the book and the book arrived and I took the book to bed and I think I read it you know within three days and it was like a little comfortable warm wonderful thing that I took to bed with me <laughs> in the best possible way <laughs> and the way I would describe it is like you, you your voice was like a beacon it was like a uh, having a, a hype girl you know a cheerleader and wow after 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 everything not just in the, the, the few years that had passed but everything else it was uh it was electricity it was kind of this energy came in and so thank you. <laughs> thank you for writing your book. <laughs> and I You're thought, welcome. Fuck, yeah, thank you. Um, and I thought, fucking hell, this, yes, yes, this is, what, what, where has this voice been? Because I wasn't able to give this voice to myself and no one else around me could give it to me. So that's what you did. And when I'd finished the book, I did something quite unlike me and I, 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 you know, I took a step to, to, to book in and we had a call, we had a chat. And then the next thing was I was signed up to your eight week program. And in fact, this room I'm sitting in was where I spent most of the time when I was on the calls with you. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it feels, it feels emotional. Like, yeah. I know. <laughs> so the eight weeks um, on a Saturday and uh, I know again, I, cause I've, I've listened to so many of your podcasts and I, and I've gotten so much from not just listening to you, but listening to the other women speaking, but those who've done the course with you, what it gave other than your, um, your guidance and your wisdom, it gave me community. It gave me a community with, with people that I could see because there's, there's communities online, but that can be a real rabbit hole you know and it can feel very disconnected this was incredibly connected I got community and I got connection and it was like bearing witness to other people and their stories and it made me feel less alone because it's just amazing to me that women we still feel so alone alone when we're going through it feels like we are the only ones and with my own my, my own kind of story I felt well what I would always be very tentative and if I would share it with people because I thought they're just going to look at me like I'm loco you know <laughs> you had a dream when you were 19 but what are you talking about but for me it was real for me it was it, it was and and here I was having had these experiences 
which were were literally real so um I just I got so much out of that time even if I was just listening and I was listening to the way that you were talking um and I felt like I became like a student in a way because I I I've, I'm very interested in the mind body connection uh I I I've become really keen to to understand and learn and read and and that's what you gave you gave a lot of recommendations uh of other people's work you know not not just what of, of, of from you but from what other people had written about so I I ordered more books and more books arrived and I read those books and I was underlining stuff and uh I was ex- you know it was an authentic excitement it wasn't coming from a place I've got a hustle I've got a hustle and I'm afraid it was it was very positive and I remember I'd, I'd come out the room after a, a, a coaching call <laughs> and I would I'd almost like go next door and give Adam a little pep talk right okay come on here we go yeah <laughs> and he's god love him he's 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 a uh you know he's a very easygoing uh man and and he was just he would just look at me and and and, and nod and smile and um and we went into the third round of IVF and this is this is this is the key thing right i went into that third round feeling different and i felt better and i felt like i got my i got some power back because i i i handed so much of it i just sort of offloaded so much to other people and regardless of the outcome, regardless, because there are no guarantees, who doesn't want to go through a cycle of IVF feeling better, feeling energized? So um, we did that and it, we, we didn't have as many embryos as the first, but more than the second. And we went in, I went in for a day three transfer, not knowing, having no idea what we were working with, but we knew that we were going to do a transfer going into the room and they said yes we have a good embryo today and I remember just lying there kind of literally trying to high five the, the doctor and the nurse because I was loving everyone around me because I remember you talked about vibrations and high higher frequencies and that's what I really resonated with I said I'm going to go through this IVF on a higher frequency that's what I'm going to do so even the nurse who took my blood and she'd seen me right through she even she started kind of like responding to me differently how's my katie today oh you're my favorite patient i love you whoa where's this come from and i because i i believe it's because i was just going coming bringing this whole new frequency so the transfer was good and i felt good and two weeks later positive a positive pregnancy test positive pregnancy test um and it but it felt of course of course because this is this is the right this is the way and I I shared that news with you and we've been having some one-to-one calls um and I didn't get a scan until I was about 13 weeks and the scan was good I'll never forget it it was amazing you know there was a fully formed baby everything was looked normal everything looked fine And the following week, we told our parents and we really, before I hadn't allowed myself and perhaps hadn't been given the opportunity to really indulge in all of that stuff where how are we going to tell people the cute ways that you can let people know. So we planned all of that, went back home, told our parents, and then a week later had just a standard scan with the NHS. And, you know, probably one of the worst days of my life, they, they told us, that the woman did, again completely different sonographer always seeing different people she was just quiet and that that quietness I'd felt I'd had before and I was just lying there and I just I just thought you you've got to be kidding me because I knew and she said I'm so sorry and uh it's it's difficult to verbalize what that feels like uh I think I, I went into a state of shock and I don't want to minimize or, or feel like I'm skimming over this part, but um, the, one of the first things that came into my mind was, what are we going to tell our parents? Just That was the first thing that came in, was thinking about what it's going to feel like for them. And 
that that process physically obviously is quite different because you're that much further along. I was 16 and a half weeks and it was horrific. It was complete trauma, um, that loss. And I remember the bereavement mid- midwife coming in and I was just, I hadn't slept. I, you kind of, it's almost like you have an out-of-body experience. And I remember her saying to me, look, we're going to bring your baby back in for a second time. You know, do you want to see your baby one more time? Because she said, I know you might not like me saying, saying this to you, but this might be the only chance you get. This, there may not be another baby. So do you want to see your baby one more time? <laughs> and you know what I thought? The first thing I thought was, fuck that, fuck off. I didn't say it to her. That was the thought I had. And here's the really interesting thing. Because for all of the gremlin, I've had this kind of counter voice, which you say, Roseanne, is the desire. It's the desire in your heart. And that's what came up in that moment. It it was a sort of a rude response to this woman telling me there may not be. And that was a desire in my heart, just just letting rip. Um, but I went, I, I did, I nosedived and I went, I went downhill, um, understandably, because I just, I, I was completely, it's so hard to find the right words. Um, I was so completely and utterly perplexed. I couldn't believe what had, what had happened to me. That, that, that this was like, again, my worst nightmare coming true. And they subsequently couldn't find a reason. The baby, the baby girl couldn't find a reason why this had happened. Uh, and so the pain I was in and the grief, and it's really important not to conflate the two things. For anybody who's experienced loss, you need to have that space to grieve. That is an emotional thing in itself. You need to honor that. You need to feel those feelings and, 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 and let that pain happen. And I did. And I understand that friends and family would say, oh, maybe is it enough now, Katie? Because they'd seen everything else that had gone before, the previous losses, the pain, the struggle, the financial investment. I understand that people that love you say, maybe, maybe gently, is it time? But I knew that, no, l- let me grieve the loss of this baby. But no, I, it doesn't work like that. That's not how it works. <laughs> so alongside all the grieving, and, and I, I, I was quite unwell with anxiety, and, I, and I, it's really important that people get help for that. Look after yourself. And I did. Something else was happening that I... I think the desire in my heart, I suddenly realized that's not gone away. Hang on a minute. Let's just, let's just review. Even after everything, that still hasn't gone away. Okay. Maybe it's about time I really pay attention to that and I give that due credit. And we, we went into, we, it was about a year and we were ready to go back to a different clinic and they specialized in sort of immune, immune therapy, very expensive blood test, um, did a monitoring cycle. But by this point, it was just, it, I, I just felt this, this, a peacefulness. And I remember going into that clinic and I was smart. I was smiling because through all the, the shit, the onslaught, Something that, that, that I believe now is this gift, and I know that you say a lot, really, I really uh, recognize this point that actually these things can sometimes be happening for you and that there's a gift at the end of it. And that gift was I got really, really good, really good at knowing exactly what I wanted, what my boundaries were, the people pleasing, uh went right away the pendulum had to swing quite hard over to to one side and I it meant that for a little bit I had to be it was probably felt a bit harsh because I sort of I retreated quite a lot but in that retreat in that solitude I got so, so amazing at listening 
to exactly well, what do I need? What's good for me? How am I going to love myself? And this voice was, I say, it was like the voice of the most compassionate, loving mother. I developed a loving, a voice of a loving mother. And I went into my IVF with this loving mother. I, even when I decided, it's such a minute thing, but even when I decided I don't want to get on the underground because that makes me feel a bit anxious, I'm going to get the bus. And I'm not going to beat myself up and tell myself I'm being ridiculous. I'm going to get on the bus, even if it means I have to leave half an hour earlier. I'm going to get on the bus and I'm going to enjoy looking outside and then seeing the view of central London because that's what I want to do. And it's such a simple thing just to tweak the way that you view and approach. So we did this monitoring cycle and they were just saying, everything looks good. Everything looks good good and I just kept hearing it and the and people will know this you get a phone call and you hear the sound of that phone ringing and it can just fill you with dread because you're going to get be told the results and so previously those results were not good but picking up the phone to this clinic and, I, and hearing that you know everything looks fine just this monitoring cycle and maybe deep inside this subconscious this this inner kind of instinct said yeah everything is going to be fine and we got to April of 2023 and um, I'd had an, you know, I'd had this great day at work. I'm self-employed. Um, a big part of what I do is I run quiet. So I'm in front of a lot of people and it's me, it's me in the room and I'm the one that's leading. I'm the one that's inspiring and energizing, you know, in, 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 in that context, that's how I do it. And I did this big workshop Lamez, people love Lamez. I personally don't get it, but they love it. And I did this big workshop. My most successful thing, there was like 150 people. And I planned a party afterwards with sandwiches and tea. I ordered way too many sandwiches. It was, it was ridiculous. But I remember thinking, I am, and this is all tagged onto the way I started to feel. I'm amazing. I'm bossing it because I know, because I'm a mama, I got this, you know. I'd done lots of things previously in my career, but there was something about this day where everything just flowed. It was the most successful thing. I got a guy in who used to be in the show and he came and he sung and everybody loved it. And I, I'd done the arrangement. I'd done everything. And I was saying to myself, God, you're, yeah, you've, this, is, this is brilliant, Katie. You know, you've got this. You're, you're, you're fantastic. <laughs> I was really being this loving, kind, mothering voice to myself and I was also expecting my period that day and uh it didn't I went to the bathroom and no 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 period and I just I think looking back I knew I did I did I knew <laughs> but still I I didn't want to uh, dare to kind of uh, go there just yet anyway suffice to say that I, I was pregnant and by now I'm 41 and a half but the other wonderful thing from having worked with you Rosanne is that age became irrelevant so my 40th and going beyond 40 no longer held this icky kind of thing that 35 did so again thank you for that I, I, it, it wasn't yeah it wasn't it wasn't going to be a thing for me so but, but, but to give context of where I was I was 40, 41 and a half and I was pregnant and I'm not it 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 wasn't it wasn't um a walk in the park no there were moments where I I could feel that anxiety wanted to come in but by now I had accumulated so many resources I had filled my my mind and my soul with so many things to help me that I navigated through those moments so much better there was no more pacing or, or, or early morning walks I could get, I could move through those moments and come out the other side. And um, I trusted, I trusted this, this, this voice inside that, that said, is everything's going to be okay. Now, again, my way was to not tell family, partly self-preservation, but also wanting to protect them a bit. But um, this pregnancy went to full term. We, we had our daughter at the end of November. Her name is Riley, and she's next door right now. She's being very cool. I mean, she's fine. <laughs> and um, 
she is just uh, everything I hoped and dreamed for and knew. But still, there's those moments where I look at her and think, my God, it's you. You're, you're here. She brings so much joy to our family, you know. And um, I think being able to do, to do this with you is like my way of being able to share my story, not just to people I don't know and have never met, but also I will share it with people that I do know because I, I didn't necessarily fully talk about the way that I thought and felt for so many years because it made me feel odd. It made me feel a bit estranged because I thought nobody, should, I know nobody else feels this way because it just seems so improbable. Um, and I guess when I messaged you <laughs> and I did tell you after I'd had our daughter, the thing is to say that in spite of all the terrible, awful things that, that we encountered, and not just the losses, all the other things, you know, the disappointing phone calls, um, all the months that we weren't pregnant, all of that, all the tears, in spite of all of that, and even when, you know, working with you, and then I still experienced the loss, and there was a part of me that was just like, this this is just let watch it burn it's what is bullshit you know because i it doesn't matter what you say i can't escape this because this has been coming for me i know you can't tell me um in spite of all of that you can still there's always a way back you you can always come back you know so if you're feeling that way if you're in that place and you're listening to this you can always come back because i know i i i felt that way um, listening, going, walking and listening and just feeling better after hearing other people sharing. So that, that's what I'm so appreciative of to be, you know, like here talking to you. And that brings us right up. Yeah. <laughs> <Present day. laughs> I mean, wow. Wow. I mean, when you think about that, Katie, I mean, like just hearing, like I, I could feel myself like breathing shallow, yeah. you know, like as I'm like listening to this. I mean, you know, but being alongside you as this mm. is happening, you know, one of the most power, I mean, you were dropping bombs left and right. But one of the things that really caught my attention was your realization of that desire in the middle of being absolutely gutted and shattered the response from within you was fuck that like the 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 sound and the voice of your inner knowing that you desire this child and there is a child for you and you're not just going to come in here and tell me there may not be another child like it's so fascinating to me how we can't outrun truth. Truth was there the whole fucking time. And it came up loud in the face. I mean, because you could have just easily bought that. Like, and, and I'm not saying that that woman had evil intent, not at all. You know, some people come into our lives and they think that they're helping us by encouraging us to leave the dream <laughs> or to do abandon the dream. But in that pivotal moment, you heard truth. I really did. I, I really did. And uh, I think that's so important that if people don't feel like they're in touch with that part of themselves, there's things that you need to do to help you. I mean, for me, it was this very profound moment. But I think there is this internal truth. There's this inter internal world that we are creating. And I think people the things that people can do to help really fine tune that and that's what you're doing really you're helping women get much better or even just just do it at all in the first place uh to find a way to to, to listen to that and I heard it loud and clear in that moment and now I look back and I I realize that even even more yeah so what was it like? I mean, so you were truly, I mean, the day that you found out you were pregnant with Riley, like it was flow. Like you were just, I mean, it, it was, it was one of those, it sounds to me like the way you've described it. It's one of those apex moments 
where we're just like, boom, like everything is flowing. We're in the moment. We're feeling this. You, you have that sense of inner knowing. Like, how has that influenced you since? Because like one of the things, like whenever a woman tells me she's pregnant or, you know, I'm like, please don't ever forget how powerful you are. Please, if you take nothing else from this, remember this moment. Because that's just giving you a, the tip of the iceberg of what's possible. So how has that affected you since then? It has. I know I'm going to carry it forward into other things in my life. It, it's, it, it's, it's far reaching. So making decisions, making important life decisions, um, perhaps in ways that I kept myself a little bit small. I feel like now I have this this new kind of superpower that serves me so well um, that I feel that this whole new potential has has come in, and I don't know exactly where that's going to go, but I know that it's I know that that because of what I've experienced and learned, it has this beautiful forward motion that is going to benefit the way that I am a parent and the way that I can uh, achieve other things so I don't know yet I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing but I do feel like I've got this whole new thing in, it's in my pocket now it's with me all the time it's a new adventure it, like yeah. this is you've discovered an entirely different aspect of yourself you know and I want to take a, a step back because one of the you know I know women listening to this are always wondering so you had said you had gone to a new clinic they had you'd done this immune thing was there anything they did differently was it was well, it you like what did you notice was different I think actually we never moved through we never got to the point with having any kind of treatment with this clinic because because I was already pregnant but it was the monitoring cycle that they did that they wanted to just see where I'm at you know what my levels are at and everything the blood test they took and they actually I think they send it off to Chicago um oh yeah probably to Dr. Chicago KK. maybe yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. Uh, they're reading for sort of natural kills killer cells and uh, certain other immune related things and I remember my results came back for two things a little bit high so they were going to make a plan to give me this this drug for a couple of months and then retest and I remember thinking, okay, you know, if that's what feels like is the right thing to do, then it will be. I, I just, the difference was in me in thinking I'm not going to, I'm not going to clench my fists and, and feel like I'd have shut my eyes and just hold my breath almost. I feel like I've, I've held my breath for so many years, but the, I was ready to move through with this process listening far more loudly to this this feeling of the desire other than the gremlin voice that was the difference even though we hadn't we didn't actually go through with any treatment with this clinic so yeah. so this okay so i want to make sure that the women listening understand this point because this is so critical so with all of the things that you had gone through your initial recurrent miscarriage your loss of your daughter at 16 weeks finally like, hearing this insane desire in you and moving through that grief and moving through that process and allowing yourself to to become even more clear about who you actually are where your boundaries are and eliminating things from your life that weren't serving you there was an openness in you that said okay let me start to check out the next step. Let me go to this clinic. Let me make this investment to find out, is there something else I'm not seeing? That level of openness led you to a place where you didn't even need the fucking treatment, Katie. No, no, I didn't. This, but I was willing. I was willing. Well, mm. and then sometimes that's all it takes mm -hmm. is that part of you that opens up that something that had not worked before and that maybe you were you could have been afraid of because think about it you had natural pregnancies before and you could have been in a place because of the gremlin that you were carrying saying you know this is never going to work for you 
you know, see, look at your past. Like you had become something so different from that, that when you find out you're pregnant naturally after all of this craziness, all of the heartache, all of the heartbreak, that you could be in a place where, and you're doing this event with 150 people and you're at this, you know, peak moment. I'm okay. Yeah. My That's baby's it. okay. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's so huge because, I mean, I felt the same way mm-hmm. when I was pregnant with Asher. Mm-hmm. Like, all of these people were coming, like, because, you know, by that time, you know, and with my shady fertility history, like, I, you know, conceived him, we conceived him naturally. I wasn't worried at all. Like, I was just like, eh, he's here. This is what was meant for me. I mean... You know, and we all have, like, it, you have a choice the whole time. You could live your pregnancy in fear, or you could live it in the joy that you've created. And it sounds like you found that place. Yeah, and it's, it, 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 is, it, it is as simple as that. It's a choice. It is a choice. And I chose to celebrate this amazing fact of the matter that I still really, really felt this strong, beautiful desire. And I decided that that was, that was the truth. And that when I discovered I was pregnant, um, you would logically, you would think that progressively, the more and more, more stuff, that this would be the time I'd be absolutely f- falling down, you know. And I, I was the opposite. I mean, I, I went... I a week before we had her, I was standing in front of my choirs. I was bopping along and waving my hands and shaking my, you know, whatever. And my members were a bit like, "Are you okay? Take it easy." (laughs) Be pregnant, lady. I was fine, and the baby was moving inside me. One of the songs we did was "Sweet Child of Mine." I mean, what what are the chances? And so. And I could feel her moving around and, and yeah, because I just kept coming back to this, to this thing, which was a choice to come back to, which, yeah. Wow. It was the, the, the loving mother that I found for my, for my, for myself through, through the pregnancy. Mm. I love that for you. And I've got to ask, is it what you thought it would be? Oh, <laughs> um, Yes, but again, this is where what I've learned, this gift has really helped because it's a, suddenly when you're pregnant and you have a baby, all of this other stuff comes in and people, people come in and they have things that they tell you. But because, because of what I've gained, I knew that that wasn't going to make me wobble or, or, or overthink or worry because my obsessive brain, my obsessiveness that had gone before I knew that 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 wasn't going to be allowed here, no. So it's meant that um, actually, like they tell you about sleep deprivation and all of that, but it's been on my terms. Again, it's, yeah, everything, that's true, but it's felt, um, it's felt like it's, it's on, it's what, it's on her terms actually, isn't it? But uh, yeah, I haven't (laughs) let this external. She's your daughter. Yeah. But I haven't, daughter. yeah, I haven't let this external space come in and, and dictate, you know? Mm. So, and of course it's just, it's just beyond, it's, it's, it's wonderful, magical. You know, my mum came, came to visit me yesterday and we, we went out and just both of us sat there. My mum and I sat gazing down at, at my daughter and we have the same eyes, right? So I get my mother's eyes and Riley has my eyes. <laughs> Yeah, so that you 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 can't beat that. I mean, that's just unbelievable. And now you know, Katie, that you can pass this on to her. You can you can teach her from a place of knowing. You're not just going to pep talk her because it's something you heard on the television. It's yeah. something that you have learned through your own life experience. And you're going to be able to foster in her that resilience. 
Because frankly, I mean, like you did the hardest thing you could possibly do. You came back from the darkness and, and now like you can fucking do anything. Like truly, like I always tell women, I'm like, look, after you've called in this miracle baby, business, record deals, whatever it is that you want, that's a piece of cake, you know, com by comparison. So I just, you know, I'm so grateful not only to know you and have had the honor to be by your side, it's just extraordinary to me to be reminded of the power of when a woman really gets into that desire, the power of the yes, the power of trusting yourself over your fear that you chose something higher. And I would love it if like, if, if you could sh say anything, like if you think back to the woman that you were when you were a listener, <laughs> when you were just a listener, as opposed to a guest, like what would you want these women listening to know in addition to what you've shared? The first, the, the main thing is acknowledge, celebrate, and feel proud of yourself for really um, recognizing that you have this desire to, have, to, to, to bring your baby in. That's fantastic, that's brilliant. And that is the starting point. Don't let that, that light dim, you know? Show yourself an abundance of kindness and love and respect because that's just precious. Go, that's the main starting point because it took me a long, long time to get, to get to that point. And the second thing I'd say that if you feel like you've been on this hamster wheel and things haven't been working and it's just felt so stressful and it's brought you so much unhappiness and worry and fear because I, I, was, I was swimming in a pool of fear and scarcity. Start to ask different questions. Get curious. Be humble. Open up to the ways that, that, that there are there, the resources to strengthen your mind-body connection. If you've never meditated, if you're a bit dismissive, you're a bit unsure, well, why don't you explore that more? There are so many things that, that we can overlook and certainly connecting with what you create, uh, the platform that you offer. But don't, don't deny yourself that um, because it is such a key piece. And if the, the, those, two, those two things running alongside, if nothing else, regardless of what the outcome is and what the result is, you're going to feel better and you're going to see it uh, create waves and consequences and impacts in your life just in general. And that is a positive thing. Mm. And, and then just let it go from there, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's living proof of thoughts, beliefs, actions, results. I mean, 100%. like... 100%. I mean, it, it blows my mind, Katie. And, you know, and, and from where we stand today, it's easy for us to see. But it's also, you know, people are so quick to want to look at everything else instead of themselves. When the ability and, and the drive and the desire, it's all here. It's like all starts here. But this is the last place we look. From the neck down. From the neck, neck I down. <laughs> yeah, neck down. That's right. I, got, I got to say that the, one of the best things you said, like, I love your hell yes, you know, it's the, he it's the hell yes to it. That's what I sort of made me feel so joyous. And I remember there was a chorus and, and you said probably one of the best things ever. You said, I'm not dicking around with maybe. And I'll never forget <laughs> that. That's the best thing anyone's ever said. <laughs> ever. Life is too short for me. Exactly. Katie. But like, it's either hell yes or hell no. Yeah, There's no exactly. in between. There's, That's it. It, like life is way too short for, for beige. It's way too mm -hmm. short for maybe. Like we can't live that way. And especially not if you're a woman with a big vision for her life. Mm -hmm. Like you have and like you have for your daughter and your daughter's daughters. And, you know, it's just we are literally shaping our family tree by leaving old stories behind and creating a new path 
for our families to be heading in. And I'm so freaking happy for you. You have just created this new path for your family. And it all started with you being willing to answer the call, you being willing to move past the fear, your excuses, and oh, can I do this? Like, and and it's just, that's why like this, you sharing your experience is just such a blessing to all of us, Katie. And I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. You're changing so many lives by speaking your truth and and sharing what's real for you. So thank you so much for joining us, woman. And you got a hug, Riley, from me. And I cannot wait. I'm going to let you, you know, we're doing the world tour. So the world tour is coming to the UK. Oh, yes. Well, I'm here. I'm in West London. So you let me know. <laughs> I'll hop on a bus, probably not a bus, not cheap. And I'll come and see you. I really um, hope yeah. that we Are can make that happen. <laughs> I don't care what I have to do. I'm going to be, I'm going to see you and it's going to be so amazing. So I thank you, wait. Katie. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you so much, Roseanne. And thank you for everything that you do. Yeah, I'm still listening. I'm going to keep listening. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You never oh, know. Yeah. We never know. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you, woman. Thank you. Love this episode of the Fearlessly Fertile podcast? Subscribe now and leave an awesome review. Remember, the desire in your heart to be a mom is there because it was meant for you. When it comes to your dreams, keep saying hell yes.